As our application grows larger and larger, there will be a need for our components in the app to share data with each other. The notion of state management is to have a central location to store all the state or data in our application so that any component can easily access the data from this central location anytime and anywhere that they like. There is no need for us to do something what we call as prompt drilling, which means to pass the data from one component to its child and to its grandchild, so on and so forth. For example, suppose we have four components here and we have a state called user that we declared in component one. Now, component four requires this user state to work properly. Traditionally, to achieve this, we will need to pass this user state as a prop to component two, component three, and finally component four. While this will not cause an issue, however, component two and three are not direct consumers of this user state. And that makes it a little bit shitty because we got to write extra code in component two and three to pass this data to component four. How do we make it better then? Well, we can use state management. So we will create a central location and create our user state there and just get component four to read from the central store. That's it, problem solved. Now, while the notion of state management is fairly simple, however, the implementation might be a little bit complicated. Generally speaking, there are a few options for us to use state management in the React ecosystem. The first and the oldest solution is a library called Redux. It is a third-party library that has been used by big enterprises since the early days of React. The thing is, Redux is quite complicated and it might be intimidating for beginners. So after the success of Redux, the React team worked on a native solution to implement a state management system using React Hook out of the box. And it is something called the Context API so that the React user doesn't need to rely on the third-party solution like Redux anymore. In the next few lessons, we'll explore the Context API and apply it to our timer app. I'll see you there. Key takeaways for this lesson, state management is the notion of having a central location to store all the components state. It eliminates the need of prod drilling and it makes it easier for component to share data. React supports state management natively through the Context API. That's it for now and I'll see you again in the next video. The first thing that we want to do to set up the Context API is to create a context. But what is a context, you may ask? Well, a context is like a container that holds our global state data. Let me show you how it works. First of all, let's create a new folder in our project and I'll call it store. Now this store folder will contain all the code that we need for the state management. And just for demonstration, I'll create a new file here and I'll call it global store. And within this file, we need to create a context. To create a context, we need to call the create context function provided by the React library. As mentioned just now, this is the container that will hold all the data in our global store. Once we're done, let me show you how to load data into this global store now. First of all, let's quickly export the global context and we'll go to our main JSX file to register the global store. Let's import the context. Now the context object exposes a few properties that is needed for us to register the global store. And I'm talking about the provider property in particular. The provider property is actually a React component where we should wrap it around our app components in order for the context API to work. Now the provider component accepts a prop called value and this is where we can pass in the initial value of our data in the store. Let's create a dummy object for now and we'll pass this object to the value prop. We can read this state in any component that was wrapped underneath the provider component. Let's try it out. We'll go to our home page and to read the data inside the global store, we will need to call another hook function called useContext. And the hook function will set one argument, which is the context object instance. Let's console out the result of this function and we'll see what will show up in our browser console. Oh dear, we see an error. Seems like there's an import issue in our global store 
Let's fix it by using ES6 import rather than a require function from CommonJS. And now back to our browser, we can now see the global store object containing the data that we passed to the provider. Build default. Isn't that neat? We can now read the data in our global store by simply using the use context hook function. However, I'm not too happy with the current API at the moment. To read the data from the global store, we currently need to import the hook function and also the context object. Let's make a small improvement on this procedure. Why don't we delegate this logic into our global store? We'll go back to our global store file and we'll create a helper function called useGlobalContext and we'll return the result of useContext right here. And that means back inside our homepage, in order for us to get a global store, we can now replace a code here with just one function code. And that will make our life a lot easier. We'll go back to our browser and we can still see the global store printed out in a console as before. Great. But now if you look back at our main JSX file, as our app grows larger, the content inside our store will get larger as well. And the main JSX file will not be the best place for us to define the content of our store. And the code here looks a little bit messy as well. Let's migrate them to our global store file just like what we did before. We will create a React component and this component will be a simple wrapper around the provider property from the global context. And then we'll relay all the props onto the underlying provider component. Once we're done back inside the main JSX file, we can now simply load our global provider component to replace what we had before. Let's test our code. We'll go back to our browser. There wasn't any error and we can still see the global store object in a console. And that is the basic on how we can set up state management using the context API and how to read the data from the store. We haven't learned about how to mutate or change the data in a store yet, and we'll talk more about it in the next lesson. I'll see you then. Key takeaways for this lesson. A context object is a container that holds data. The provider property in a context object is a React component that is required to wrap around our app components for the context API to work. If we do not use the provider property, then the context API will simply refuse to work. The use context hook function allow us to read data from the store. That's it for now, and I'll see you again in the next video. A reducer is a function to mutate the state or data in the store. Because of its unintuitive name, a lot of people doesn't know what the f it means when they first saw the term. Let's create a reducer now and look at the syntax. So a reducer is essentially a function with a very specific signature. The first argument is the state that's currently inside the store. And the second argument is something what we call an action payload, which is basically the data that we will pass in when we trigger the reducer later. We will come back to this action argument in just a bit. It is easier to explain it when we see it in action. For now, we'll console log out both of the arguments just for demonstration. Now a reducer function has a very specific trait. That is, whatever we return in this function will override the entire state in a store. And that's how a reducer can modify the state in a store. For now, we will return the state as it is and we will export this reducer function. Once we have defined a reducer, we need to register it. And to do that, we can use another hook function called useReducer. The hook function will set the reducer as its first argument and the initial state as the second argument, which in our case will be our state variable. Now the useReducer hook will return us an array. The first element of the return array is the reactive version of the state similar to what would have happened to the data passed to the useState hook function. Now the second element in a return array is what we call a dispatcher function. The dispatcher function is a function to trigger the reducer registered by this hook. And the first argument that we pass to the dispatcher function will become the action argument inside the reducer. Let me show you what I mean. But before we do that, let's refactor our code here because I don't think we need to declare our state variable up there anymore. 
we can simply pass it directly to our use reducer hook function. And now we will also modify the value prop in our provider component. So we're passing in the reactive state and also the dispatcher function. This will allow us to access the dispatcher function in any component in our app. The dispatch function will trigger the reducer and the state is a representation of all the data in the store. And that means we can read or modify our global state anywhere that we like in our app. Let's try to call the dispatch function. We'll go to our home page and we'll run our dispatch function in the onClick event listener of this button. Just for demonstration, I'll call the dispatch function with an argument of some silly string. Remember, this argument will become the action of the reducer. And remember, our reducer at the moment does nothing but merely console logging the state and the action argument. Let's go to the browser and see what will happen. Whoops, we got an error. Seems like I have broken the rule of the hooks because I'm calling the use reducer hook function in a global scope. Let's move it inside a global provider component. And seems like that fixes the issue. And now to trigger our reducer, we simply need to click on this little button here. And as you can see in the console, we are seeing the state and the action argument from the reducer. The action is ABC, which is exactly what we pass to the dispatch function, and state is the data in our store. Now passing a string as the action of the reducer doesn't seem to be very helpful. Since we can literally pass anything to the dispatcher function, a more useful data structure would be an object. Typically, we would pass an object that contains two properties, a type property that defines the operation type which in our case here, we wanted to update the only field in our store, which is the hey key. And the second property is the payload, which is whatever data that is associated to our operation. In this context would be the new value of the hey key. So ideally, after running the dispatch function, we would like to see ice cream inside our global store. Let's refactor our reducer so it will work as expected. Now we're assuming the action is an object that contains two properties, the type and the payload. And type could be a variety of different strings. And we need to handle each string on a case by case basis. The easiest way to achieve this is to use a switch statement. Currently, we only got one case, which is update hey. And the logic is to update the hey property. So what I'm going to do is to return a new object that contains everything in the current state, but I'm overriding the hey property and the value will be equal to action.payload. For the default case of the switch statement, we'll simply return the state as it is. And now let's go back to the browser and we'll open up the developer tool and we'll click on our global provider component. And now notice that currently we have hey mate. The moment when I click on the button, it changes to hey ice cream. Isn't that great? This is basically how a reducer work. And again, its purpose is to update the data in the store. All right, before we end the lesson, let's quickly make some improvement on our code. Since the reducer operation is fixed, let's create a constant for that. And we'll reference it both inside the reducer and also when we call the dispatch function in the home page. The benefit of having this action object is that it makes refactoring a lot easier in the future if we ever need to do so. All right. Key takeaways for this lesson. Reducer is a function that mutates a state in our state management store. We can register a reducer using the use reducer hook function. We use the dispatcher function returned by the use reducer hook to trigger the reducer. That's it for now, and I'll see you again in the next video.
Consumer is yet another way to read data from a state management store. Similar to provider, it is a property from the context object and it is also a React component. Let me show you how it works. First of all, let's go to our home page. And what I'm going to do here is to import our global context object and call the consumer property on it to create a component inside our DOM. Now the consumer component has a very specific trait. That is, we can only put a function within the component as its child. And a function should accept one argument, which represents the data in a store. And a function should return HTML elements that will be rendered inside the DOM. And just for demonstration, I'll simply return a simple div and I'll read the hey property from the state. And just a quick recap, currently in our store, we have two properties, the state and the dispatcher function. And within the state, we only got one hey property. Now let's go to the browser. And now we can see that we've got a mate in a DOM. Beautiful. So consumer is basically an alternative syntax for us to read the data from our store. Now you might be wondering, how can a consumer be useful? Well, to a retail store manager, a difficult consumer like a Karen could be a nightmare. However, to a React store, a consumer could be used to conveniently render components that have no business logic and are tightly coupled to the data in a store. For example, in our app, we might want to have a user avatar icon that we want to use over and over again across multiple places, just like the avatar icon in the Google homepage. Now this component would contain some user information of the current login user, like the name and the image URL. But the component itself does not contain any business logic. The purpose is just to render the user's avatar. And now this scenario will be a perfect use case for a consumer to shine. And we could wrap the consumer in a normal React component so we can easily use it across our app. Let me show you a quick example. Let's quickly create a new component called HeyMate. And I'll move the consumer code that I had before to this component. So this hey mate is really just a wrapper around what we have done already. And now back inside the home component, rather than writing all this mess, we can totally simplify it to this hey mate component. And back to our browser, we can still see our mate inside the DOM. Okay, so again, consumer is only useful when a component is tightly coupled to a data inside the store. It is just another way for you to read the data from the store. All right, key takeaways for this lesson. Consumer is an alternative way to read data from the store. Consumer is a React component and it can only accept a function as its child. The function should return a DOM node. Consumer is best to use as a DOM component that is tightly coupled with the state in the store. That's it for now and I'll see you again in the next video. Okay, we'll put everything together and build a dashboard. Here's what we're gonna build. We can divide this page into three parts. The first part is a timer header, followed by a plus button. And when we click on this button, we'll add a new timer card in the middle. The second part is the timer cards. We can remove or edit the cards as we wish. Lastly, we have the start button and also a switch to indicate whether we want to loop the timers indefinitely. All right, let's get into business right away. First of all, we'll create a new page component called timer, and we'll add a new route for this page in our public routes.js file. Now we'll go back to our timer page component. And just like what we mentioned before, we have three sections here, the header, the cards, and the start button. And I'll wrap everything in our public layout component. And now for the headers, I'll quickly add the h1 tag. With a plus button wrapped around our tooltip component. Let's check it out in our browser. And it is looking great. And now let's work on a card section in the middle. Essentially, we are rendering an array of timer objects for this card section. So the first step is to create a state management store to put our timer objects. We'll create a new file called timer store 
and inside it will create a new object that contains a property called timer and this is where we'll store our timers array. Now each timer would have an ID, title and duration. I'm just hard coding the properties for now just for testing purposes. In the real world, the ID should really be unique. We could achieve this by generating a UUID from the UUID package. Let's quickly install it. And we'll call the v4 function to generate the UUID for our timers. And then we'll export the timer store object and import it back inside our global store JSX file. We'll get rid of our dummy data that we created in the previous episode and put in a new property called timer. And this is where we'll put in everything related to our timer store. And we'll load our timer store state into this object. Having this structure is great because in the future, if we've got other store, we can simply add more to our provider while keeping them organized. All right, now we'll create a new component called timer list where we'll render all the timer cards. Now in this component, we'll get all the timer objects from the store and for each of the object, we'll render a card. Since the main purpose of this component is to merely render something and it doesn't have any business logic, so this is the perfect place for us to use a consumer. So we'll use consumer from the global context and retrieve all the timers from our timer store. And now we're going to convert each of the timer into a card. Let's create a new component for that. And we'll call it timer list item. And we'll load it back inside our timer list component. And back inside our timer page, we will load our timer list component to make sure everything is working fine. Looking good. And now let's build a skeleton of our timer list item component. We will create a square and within a square, we basically have two elements. The first block is the input and the second block is the delete icon. For the input, we have an editable input for the title and another one for the duration. We'll go ahead and start the elements for a bit so they are displayed properly inside our DOM. All right, we'll leave the business logic for now. Let's correct the third section, which is a start button and the toggle. We can use the button outline and the toggle component that we created previously for these two elements. All right, now that we have done with the scaffolding, let's add the business logic. We will start with the plus button beside our timer header. So when we click on this button, we are expecting a new timer card to appear in this dashboard. And that means we need to add a new object to the timer array in our store, which means we need to introduce a reducer to mutate the state inside the store. Let's add a reducer to our timer store. And just a quick recap, a reducer would take in the store state as its first argument and the action payload as the second argument. We will use the switch statement to handle the operation types and will define a series of possible actions inside a constant variable. So when the action type is equal to set timer, we'll simply mutate our timer store state and then we'll export our actions and our reducer function so we can register them back inside our global store. Let's refactor our code for a bit. We will call the useReducer hook function to register our timer reducer. And pass the return state and dispatcher function into the provider. And now we've got access to the dispatcher function, we should be able to add more items into the timer array in the store. We'll go back to our timer page and add an event listener to the plus icon. We will call it add timer and within the event listener, 
we need to trigger the dispatch function from the timer store. Let's import our timer store by calling the use global context function and we'll also extract out our timer state for easy access. And now within our add timer function, we simply need to call the dispatch function from our timer store and pass in the action payload. For the action type, it will be set timers and the payload is an array of all the existing timers plus a new timer object. And now, in theory, when we click on a plus button now, a new card should pop out inside the DOM. There you go. It is working beautifully. We are now able to add a timer. We should also implement the ability to delete a timer by clicking on the rubbish bin icon. We'll go to our timer list item component and add the event listener to the delete button. We'll call the event listener remove item. And what we're going to do inside this function is to find the index of the current timer object inside our timer store and remove it from the array. First of all, let's import our timer store. And in order for us to get the index, let's quickly create a helper function to compute the current timer index. Next, we'll remove the timer object by calling the dispatcher function and again the set timer action to reset the whole timer array so that we're not including the current timer object in this component. All right, let's give it a go. We will click on the delete button and the card is removed. We'll add more timer and they can all be deleted. This looks pretty good. However, we still have a lot more to do. For example, editing the timer title and the duration. I think it's a good place to stop for now and we'll continue in the next lesson. Okay, now let's implement the logic so that we can edit the text within our timer cards. First of all, let's create an event listener on the title input field. We'll call it update title. And what we're going to do inside this event listener is to first get the state from the store. In other words, finding the particular timer object from our store. And then we'll update the title field inside it. And finally, save it back inside the store. So to get our timer state from the store, we can simply make use of our helper function get item index from the previous episode and we can create a new updated timer object by unpacking the previous timer object and overriding the title field. For the new value, we can simply grab it from our event target property. And now we need to call the dispatcher function to override our target inside the store. Again, we can make use of the existing set timers action and the payload will be all the timers object before our target index plus our updated timer and finally everything after our target index. All right, let's give it a go. I'll go ahead and edit the first timer object and as you can see, we can edit the title without any issue. Let's add another timer. Edit the title. Looking good. And now let's verify the state inside our React developer tool within a global provider. We can see that our states are indeed updated in the store. So far, so good. Let's do the same for the duration field as well. Similar as before, we need to create an event listener and attach to our editable input element. And now the code will be very similar to what we have done already inside the update title event listener. So we just need to copy and paste, right? Well, hold on a sec. Copy and pasting is a big red flag. Technically speaking, the only thing that we need to do differently this time is the field name. So instead of title, what we wanted is the duration field. And the rest of the function is basically the same. So the big question now here is, can we do better without copy and pasting? Well, you know the drill, the answer is yes. We are going to use some magic to work around this. There are a few ways to solve this issue 
But here, I'm going to apply some functional technique to solve this problem. Now, the idea is to co-write a higher order function that returns an event listener function. Let me show you how it works. We will co-write another function called update timer, and it will accept an attribute argument. Now, this attribute argument will be our field name. In other words, either title or duration. And as we mentioned before, this is a high order function that will return the actual event listener. So we will return a function here. And the logic inside this function is basically the same as what we have done before in the update title function. We will copy and paste the existing logic. But this time, rather than hard coding the field, we will make it dynamic by referring to the attribute argument. And now look at this. We've got a function that will create the event listener. And that means we can refactor our existing code by throwing our existing event listener into the bin because we cannot create our event listener by calling our update timer function. We just need to change the attribute argument and everything should work fine. Let's test our code. I'll change the title and durations and verify it in a React developer tool. And everything seems to be working fine. Beautiful. And I just noticed that our timer cards are not aligning properly. Let's fix that by applying some classes in a timer list component. Let's flex some magic. And that should do the job. OK, let's move on. We will work on the logic for the toggle now. So every time when we toggle on the loop indefinitely switch here, we should update a state in a store. And that means we need to add a new data inside our store. Let's go to our timer store and we'll add a new field code is infinite inside the state object. And we'll give it a default value of true. And now back inside our timer component, we will simply read the is infinite state from our store, bind the value of the toggle, and also create a new event listener for our toggle component. So inside this on toggle event listener, what we want to do is to update the is infinite state. Currently, our reducer cannot handle this operation. Let's go to our reducer and implement this logic. It is the same kind of rule. Let's add a new action. And in a switch case, we'll simply override the value of the is infinite state, where we'll get a new value from the payload property in the action. All right, let's go back to our timer component. And now inside the on toggle event listener, we simply need to call the dispatcher function. The type will be our newly created action, which is set is infinite, and the payload would come from the event target and a check property. That comes from the underlying checkbox HTML element. All right, let's test our code. If we click on the toggle, it seems to be working. And if we look at the developer tool, our is infinite state is indeed changing. Beautiful. All right, I think it's a good place to stop here. In the next lesson, we will implement the logic on what will happen after we click on the start button. I will see you there. OK, now the next thing we want to build is the logic to run our timer. And just a quick demonstration again, when we click on the start button, we'll go into a new page that has a countdown clock, which is based on what we have defined in the dashboard. We can pause the timer or resume the timer or stop the timer. All right, without further ado, let's dive into the code. OK, first thing first, let's create the timer page. I'll go ahead and create a new folder in our pages directory called timer and also a start component inside it. Next, we will register this component inside our public routes.js and add another route to render the start page. Now notice that I'm keeping my files and folder structure the same as our routes path. This will keep our files and folders organized and help us to easily maintain and debug our code. All right, next, we will go to our timer dashboard and modify the start button so that we're redirected to the start page when we click on it. We can do so by wrapping the button around with a link component. All right, let's test our code. We will go to our browser. If I click on the start button, we are redirected to the start page, where at the moment there's nothing in it. So far, so good. OK, let's go to our start page now and we'll build the component. First thing first, let's load our layout 
And we know that this page has mainly two components, a preview and also the base timer. We have created the base timer component in a previous episode, but we haven't done anything with the preview component. Let's quickly build it now. We will create a new file inside our timer folder and I'll call it previewtimer.jsx. And we'll load the component inside our start page. And now this component is really just a dumb component that will show two information. First, the upcoming timer object's title. And second, the upcoming timer's duration. Since we're showing the timer's information, we'll get this component to take in a timer prop which is basically the timer object. And now just for demonstration, we'll quickly pass a timer prop to this component inside our start page. So we'll load our first timer object from our timer store. And pass it to the preview timer component. And now let's open our browser and start building the preview timer component. So for the timer title, we'll create an H1 element. We will increase the size, give it a gray color, and also reduce the opacity to 80%. And now I would like to show the up next label before the title. So let's create a span element, which has a smaller size compared to the actual title. For the duration, we'll have a P tag and we'll give it a gray color, opacity, and also a smaller font size compared to the title. All right, looking good. We'll also give the whole component a little bit of padding and margin bottom to maintain social distancing from the elements around it so it won't get COVID-19. Okay, let's go back to our timer page. And the next thing we want to do is to put in the countdown clock. In the previous episode, we have already built a base timer component. So let's just add it in here. And just a quick recap, the base timer component accepts a few props. We will put in the timeout and the title property. And just for testing purposes, I'll be using the first timer in our store just to render the component correctly. We should also pass the on start, on finish, and on stop hook function so it can do something whenever this event happens. So basically, when a countdown has expired, we want to move on to the next timer object. So that means in the on finish hook, we need to change the current timer into the next timer that was listed inside the preview timer component. And this means that we need to have a way to keep track of our current timer index so we know that which timer to run next. And within the onFinish hook, when there's no timer left, then we should stop the countdown clock. A way to keep track of the timer index is to create a new state in our timer store where I'll set the default value to be zero. And now back inside our start page, we can easily get our current timer by using the current timer index. We will quickly refactor our DOM so that we're using the current timer object rather than hard coding to be the first item in our timers array. And now in the onFinish hook, for us to move on to the next timer, we simply need to add the current timer index state in our store by one. And to do that, we need to define a new action in our reducer. and add a new case inside the timer reducer function. And now back to our start page, to move the current timer to the next timer, we simply need to call our new action by using our dispatcher function and the payload will be the current timer index plus one. However, we're not done yet. We still need to handle the situation where the current timer is the last timer in the array. So that means we need a mechanism here to check whether we are at the end of the array or not. It is pretty simple. We just need to check if the current timer index is equal to the total timer length minus one. And we should only move on to the next timer when we are not at the end. 
Now, when we have arrived in the last position in a timer array, we gotta do another check here. That is to check whether the user has turned on the is infinite option. If yes, then we want to reset the current index to zero and repeat the whole cycle again. If not, we also want to reset the current index back to zero because the user might manually click on the start button in a dashboard. And we also do want to put a stop to the loop. Now, one of the ways to control the loop is to have a local state here and I'll call it has stopped. This has stopped state will control whether we want to stop the whole timer cycle and to redirect the user back to the home page or not. So back inside our on finish function, we will run a check. If the user did not want the timer indefinitely, then we want to set has stopped to true. And since we're going to reset the index back to zero anyway, so we can simply call the dispatcher function at the very end and I'll set the payload to zero this time. And now let's go down and refactor the DOM based on our has stopped state. We only want to show the preview timer and the base timer when has state is false. If the timer is stopped already, then we want to show a message telling the user that we are done and have a link to redirect the user back to the dashboard. Let's test our code. And oh dear, we've got an error. It says that we cannot update the global store while we're re-rendering the base timer. This is likely because we're trying to do two things at once. There are mainly two issues here. Now the onFinish function was actually triggered by the base timer component. And within the onFinish function, we are trying to update the current index of the timer in the global store, which then will affect the DOM. So the problem is our onFinish function has yet to complete and we are already rendering a new base timer component. This is not acceptable and therefore React is complaining about it. How can we resolve this? Well, we could delegate the onFinish functions logic into the event loop in JavaScript by using the setTimeout function. So now the onFinish function is actually running in the event loop rather than by the base timer component. What that means is we can now safely run our onFinish function without worrying about the DOM node. Now the second issue is React may not render our base timer component correctly because we did not provide it a key. So based on our logic, Whenever we change the current timer index, we want to have a new base timer component and we need React to re-render that part of the DOM for us. To make sure React does the job for us properly, we should provide our base timer component a key prop. So this is saying whenever the current timer index state has changed, then we want to re-render our base timer component. Okay, now let's test our code for one more time. We will go back to the dashboard, click on the start button, And it is now all working without a single complaint. Beautiful. Let's also quickly style our components while we're here. We will just center the item in the middle of the page. Okay, looking good. Now there's still a few other issues that we need to address before we end the lesson. First of all, our preview timer is currently not okay. The timer that we insert into our preview timer is the current timer. That is not correct. Let's create a new helper function and I'll call it next timer. So this helper function will simply resolve the next timer for us. Within a function, we got to run a check to determine whether we are at the last item or not. If we are, then we should return the first timer when the is infinite option is turned on. Otherwise, we'll just return now. If we are not at the last item, then we'll simply move on to the next timer. Once we're done, we can simply create a new variable called preview timer to load the next timer and pass this variable to our preview timer component. And just for the sake of testing, I am going to add a new timer in our timer store. And now, as you can see, we are now seeing the correct preview timer. And let's quickly click on the start button to test our code. Once the countdown expires, we are seeing rest instead of workout now. Beautiful. The thing is, the countdown clock does not trigger automatically by itself. Let's fix that. 
we simply need to pass the order play option into our base timer component. Okay, now let's go back to the dashboard and we'll click on the start button. However, we've got a weird issue here. You can see that the countdown clock isn't working just right. Now, the reason is because we currently have strict mode turned on in our React app and our base timer has a use effect that triggers the timer automatically when the component is mounted and strict mode will trigger it twice. Therefore, the set interval function that was used behind the scene was called for two times and hence our timer was decremented by two seconds for every second passed. To resolve this, we simply need to turn off strict mode back inside our main JSX file. All right. And now the issue is gone. However, when we click on the stop button, we do want to show the all done message. We'll go back to our start page. When the on stop hook function is called, we simply need to set the has stop state to true and reset the current index back to zero. Let's test our code. So now if we click on the stop button, we are greeted by the all done message. And if we click on the back button, we're back to the dashboard. And one last thing before we end the lesson, in the onStart function, we should set the has stop state to false, even though technically we're not using this onStart function. But there's no harm for us to leave it there. Also, there's a chance that our preview timer could be now. So we should do a check before we render the preview timer component. All right, that's it. That is basically our timer app. We still have one more element to incorporate into our timer app, which are the sound effect when the countdown expires or we'll transition into a new timer. We'll continue in the next lesson. So we want to play some sound when the current timer is transitioned to the next one or when the whole timer cycle is ended. To achieve this, we can use the audio API provided by the browser out of the box. I have previously found these two sound effect to use in our app. You can find some other sound effect that suits your taste I promise I will not judge you. Anyway, here are the sound that we're gonna use in our example here. So first of all, this sound will play when the timer is transitioned to the next timer. On the other hand, this will play when the all done message is showing in the app. To get started with the audio API, we first need to load our mp3 file into our start page. And just like loading CSS file, Vid can also handle mp3 file by using the ES6 import statement. This is the recommended way to load static assets in our app project. We can just let Vid to do all the hard work for us. Anyway, once we have imported the mp3 files, we can create a new audio instance by instantiating the audio class. The audio constructor will simply take in the path to our mp3 file, which is basically our import. So now once we got our audio instance, we will play our transition notification whenever our timer is finished. However, if we have reached the end and we're not in the infinite mode, we want to play the alarm instead. So we'll pause the transition notification and call the play function on the alarm instance. When the user stops the timer manually, we should also call the pause function on both the alarm and transition notification. Okay, let's test our code now. We'll go to the browser. I don't think my screen recorder can record the sound, so you gotta trust me on this one. We'll click on the start button when the timer expires. Oh, I can hear the sound now. And if you look at the browser tab, you can see a little circle just beside the title. And that is the evidence. All right, that concludes our timer app for this series. I hope you enjoyed everything so far. We will be talking about some advanced React concept and JavaScript in part two of this React deep dive series, which will be built on top of this timer app. All right. Have a good one, and I'll see you in the next video. If you would like to see more content, consider supporting us by becoming a member at my website, Acadia.io. It is similar to Patreon, but in return, you get a lot of premium tutorials and lessons.
If you can't become a member, that's totally fine. We are just happy that you are here. We spend a lot of time and energy to produce high quality videos for you. Feel free to check out our other videos on YouTube and if you can leave a thumbs up, you will really make my day. If you subscribe, I would jump for joy and I'll make more videos for you. Thanks for your support and I'll see you next time.